Welcome everyone to the 37th annual winter lecture series on pandemics, old and new. My name is Dick Deanspear. I'm a member of the steering committee of the winter lecture series. I wanna welcome you especially because it's Valentine's Day and we are most pleased that you wish to spend your Valentine's Day with us. Although here in Lincoln, you don't have too many choices about going out because it's what, six or eight degrees below zero uh, at this time, I believe. A couple of nuts and bolts things before we begin. Uh, you, you know that we are going to be on for four consecutive Sunday evenings, beginning each time at 7 p.m. And that you can use the same invitation each time for, your, uh, for getting on. The sponsors for the Winter Lecture Series are the Winter Lecture Series Committee of the Unitarian Church, Ocher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Nebraska. And we receive support from Humanities Nebraska, who offers this greeting to you. This program is brought to you by Humanities Nebraska, a statewide nonprofit organization inspiring and enriching public life by offering opportunities to thoroughly engage with history and culture with additional funding from the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. If you enjoy this type of programming, please consider supporting Humanities Nebraska with a contribution. Donations are matched by state and federal funds. Your support helps preserve our past and inform our future. We are grateful for your support. few words about the, um, I think we can go to the next slide, Bob. A few words about the uh, winter lecture series historically, for those of you who haven't been with us in our physical setting, which is not our Zoom setting, of course. We began in 1985 at the Vine Congregational Church. And at the time, the programs were entirely regional or national, uh, individual countries and so forth. The Winter Lecture Series moved to the Unitarian Church in 2001. And um, generally, we do a combination of regions and countries, as well as topics. So the topics for the last several years, you can see on the screen, Pakistan and Afghanistan in 2010, Russia and post-Soviet states a year later, North Africa 2012, 2013, we did Iran and then cultural change and then national borders and refugees. So this is one of those like cultural change that really cuts across different areas. Um, the year after 2016, nationalism and national identity. 2017, we did income inequality and wealth. 2018 was our attempt to bring speakers in to imagine a just world order. Then Korea in 2019, which was very timely because a lot of stuff was going on with Korea in 2019. 2020, Latin America and the United States, and of course, year pandemics. People who actually put this program together this year, our program committee, are Beth Ann Brooks, John Comer, Chuck Francis, and Sherrod Sait, who's going to introduce our speaker in a few moments. Others on the Winter Lecture Series Committee are Nancy Comer, Karen Deanspear, David Forsyth, Barb Francis, David Iaquinta, and Peter Levitov. If you um, miss some of these, or you want to see some from past years, the Unitarian Church website uh, has previous winter lecture series lectures. I wanna thank uh, for the technical assistance we're, we have received from Kelly Ross and tonight from Bob Fusen, who is responsible for all the things that are going right. Thanks for administrative assistance to Jean Helms of the Unitarian Church and Patricia Saldana Newman of Ali. Jared Sait will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Dick. Uh, 
My name is Sharad Sikh. As a member of the planning committee of this lecture series, I add my welcome to all of you. On a very cold, could you, uh, could you not share the screen for a while, please? Thank you. Uh, so I add, add my welcome to all of you on a very cold and frigid day, not just in Lincoln, but much of the US. It's just as well that we are meeting today over Zoom. We are very pleased that so many of you have chosen to participate in order to avoid external interruptions and distractions when we are joining from our, from our homes. Here are a few do's and don'ts provided by our Zoom host, Kelly Ross. Your microphones will be muted for the majority of the presentation today. If you have a question for the speaker, please use the chat button, which is usually ap appears at the bottom of your Zoom window. Click the button and enter your question. It will then be saved in a queue for our Q&A session. If you are unable to access the chat feature for any reason, we hope to have time to unmute everyone at the very end of our session today and give you a chance to ask the question live. We'll also allow you to turn on your video for the Q&A portion. These instructions will also appear in the chat box as a reminder to all of you. Now, to introduce the speaker, as a graduate from the University of Illinois from many moons ago, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Carol Symes, received a PhD from Harvard and became a member of Actors' Equity in the same year. She also holds a BA from Yale and M. Lit from Oxford. PhD in Equity Actors. And a certificate in stage combat from the Society of British Fight Directors. She's currently an associate professor of history, classics, and medieval studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. It's not possible to list her many professional achievements in a short time available to me, so I'll share only just a few hi highlights here. She's the founding executive editor of the Medieval Globe, an academic journal that has played a key role in the globalization of pre-modern history. As a part of this initiative, she published an important thematic issue on the medieval Black Death as the first global pandemic in a volume edited by Dr. Monica H. Green, a renowned historian of medicine and public health. Carol's own scholarship focuses on media of communication in medieval Europe, including the manuscript transmission of ancient texts, the history of theater, and the history of documentation. She has also published widely on medievalism, in particular on the modern fascination with the medieval past. She's currently preparing to film a sequence of lectures on the medieval legacy for the great courses. In her opening presentation for this series, she will trace the history of pandemics through the ages to broaden our perspective, perspective on what we are experiencing right now. Carol, over to you. Thank you so much, Sharad. I really appreciate this invitation to speak to everybody. Um, I'm actually coming to you from Vermont um, where it's actually quite balmy compared to what you guys are experiencing in Nebraska. I'm from Vermont originally, and I'm here spending some time with my dad. Um, and, uh, but we have, we do, we, we do have about the same amount of snow as you guys do. So at least, at least we are in parity with that. And my screen is visible, Sherrod, everybody can see it. Okay, great. Um, let's get started. In 2018, the medical researchers, David Morins and Jeffrey Taubenberger commemorated the centenary of what they had called the mother of all pandemics in an important article uh, published in Emerging Infectious Diseases back in 2006. This event, the influenza pandemic of 1918-19 was a tragedy true to its Greek etymology affecting pandemos, all people within a very brief span of time causing an estimated 50 to 100 million deaths and multiplying the miseries of the Great War, which had helped to facilitate its global spread. Indeed, so rapid and pervasive was this pandemic 
that Morens and Taubenberger rejected all known hypotheses as to any single place of origin, whether the battlefields of the Western Front or Camp Funston, Kansas, where American troops were being trained to join the battle over there. Instead, the researchers posited that the virus had been silently seeded around the world, possibly well before 1918, to be triggered almost simultaneously in numerous locales. Since then, uh, DNA retrieved from victims who perished between the spring of 1918 and the winter of 1919 uh, indicate a geography spanning Alaska to England and show, as they said, little variation and all of these strains of the flu were equally virulent. The name Spanish flu, which we really should shun, is a misnomer. It reflects the fact that many combatant nations of the Great War, which did not end until November 1918, so in the middle of this pandemic, actively censored news reports of its spread. Only in neutral Spain was the reportage allowed, which gave rise to the erroneous narrative that it had emerged in Spain. Historically, there have been documented influenza pandemics dating back to the late ninth century of our era, all of them zoonotic diseases, that is, all caused by the transfer of germs from animals, in Greek, so on, to humans. In all these cases, flu is traceable to the globally mobile population of wild waterfowl and shorebirds, which could, of course, travel widely and rapidly, even in ages when humans could not. Not surprisingly, uh, these scientists' data show a marked surge in the truly global scope of influenza, where just where we would expect it in 1510, when European colonization of the Americas was devastating indigenous peoples with no immunity to foreign diseases. We can then see a steady rise and increase from there until further marked upticks in flu pandemics in the mid 19th century, when steamship travel fueled a growing global trade and tourism industry, resulting in a pandemic in 1889. In 1918 19, mortality followed an extraordinarily age specific pattern disproportionately affecting adults in the prime of life, so different from our experience now, uh, with those aged 20 to 40 dying at three times the higher rate than their older and younger contemporaries. Hence the extraordinary number, tragic number of orphaned children. Maurens and Taubenberger note that within this group, the highest mortality occurred around the age of 29. That is, those who had been born during or just after the pandemic of 1889, who had not yet benefited from any immunological effects that had helped to protect older survivors ex exposed to the virus for a longer period of time. Moreover, the pandemic disproportionately affected the poor, the malnourished, recent immigrants, dispossessed Native Americans, and Black Americans who had lived in crowded urban tenements and towns. This in turn increased white Americans loathing and distrust of those whom they had relegated to these very conditions. These racist and xenophobic socioeconomic infrastructures and political legal institutions also undergirded the increased incidence of anti-black and anti-immigrant violence in the decades ahead. The Tulsa race massacre of 1921 is just one terrible example. Although the pandemic ended in 1919, the H1N1 flu to, that caused seasonal outbreaks thereafter was replaced by a new strain in 1957, which caused another pandemic and so on and so on. But was this influenza pandemic and its devastating social effects really the mother of all pandemics? In the past decades, interdisciplinary teams of historians, linguists, archeologists, and scientists have been able to amass and analyze evidence to suggest that the medieval plague known as the Black Death is much more deserving of this appropriate and dare I say rather misogynistic mother of all pandemics moniker and that it was caused by many of the same conditions. 
While the much small, smaller global population of the 13th and 14th centuries could not make it equally deadly in absolute terms um, compared to the 50 to 100 million fatalities according, uh, uh, according to the influenza of the Great War, the Black Death surpassed that catastrophe in the percentage of people eradicated, some 40 to 60% of the entire Afro-Eurasian continental system. Um, in fact, if we look back at the graph provided, provided by Taubenberger and Morins, which maps influenza epidemics, we see that the global population was already drastically reduced in the middle of the 14th century by that medieval plague, even if it didn't have a truly global spread. And I say if, because we're still not exactly sure how widespread the medieval Black Death was. Note two, uh, that the previous population lost to the Black Death um, was also exacerbated by a rapid cooling of the Earth's climate at the end of the medieval warm period and a decade long series of famines in the Northern Hemisphere. So the link between climate change, whether warming or cooling is a significant contributor to this global pandemic as well as to our own. So I'll say a bit more about all of those things in a few minutes. But first, just in order to put the prevalence of pandemics in a deeper historical context, I want to argue that we need to recognize that pandemic episodes are a feature and not a bug of all civilizations. They can all be linked to increased human and animal mobility and commensality that is changes that enable more widespread travel and the exchange of commodities, as well as the sharing of pathogens among animals, insects, and humans who living together in close quarters are commensa, sharing the same common table. These conditions are also invariably linked to anthropogenic human-caused degradations of plant and animal habitats and the ravages of war. The very Yersinia pestis bacterium that caused the medieval Black Death um, was recently, just in 2015, shown to be at least 5,000 years old. That is, it became prevalent at the end, at the beginning of the Bronze Age, around 3000 BCE, a time of increased urbanization, intensified agricultural production, and long distance trade in the elements that made that age's co bronze, copper and tin. Fierce competition for these resources, which were only abundant in certain regions, led to increased local and regional conflicts and eventually to an arms race that was only intensified when new smelting techniques allowed iron to supersede bronze as the metal of choice for swords and plowshares both around the 8th century BCE. This means that the earliest cities in Mesopotamia, the land between rivers, provided the perfect conditions for breeding and fostering the pathogens that cause pandemics. These cities were really multi-species settlement camps in the words of the anthropologist James C. Scott, walled to protect human inhabitants from other urban competitors and resource hungry nomadic peoples. They were heavily dependent on the intensive over-cultivation of the precarious Tigris and Euphrates watersheds which were prone to both drought and flooding. This means that the legions of enslaved farmers who farmed these areas came into closer and more sustained contact with waterfowl and animals that harbored disease. Moreover, these fortified cities contained plant and animal species that were also hosts for disease. The Epic of Gilgamesh, our oldest written narrative of this era, lauds the hero's home city, Uruk, as divided into three parts densely populated neighborhoods, pits for the manufacture of more buildings and folds for livestock intermingled with gardens and orchards for withstanding times of siege. That is perfect Petri dish conditions for the spread of disease. Even before the intensified urbanization of the Bronze Age, there were enormous densely packed multi-species settlement camps like Jericho and Shatohuyuk, now in Turkey, which packed over 8,000 humans and unknown numbers of animals, insects, and pathogens into tiny spaces of as much as 33 acres, so basically the size of a park or a, a university quad. Uh, 
these cities were therefore as densely populated in their own way as Mumbai, India is today. People literally lived on top of one another in clay apartment buildings. The very fact that none of these settlements or cities survive for more than a few decades is testament to their fragile, virulent ecosystems. When we study their written records or archeological remains, James Scott observes, it's like we're looking at a snapshot of a human period pyramid precariously constructed by writhing bodies that will collapse the instant the photo is taken. The onset of both pandemic and more localized epidemics therefore was and is inevitable. Moreover, these outbreaks always have a tendency to further weaken the already fragile socioeconomic hierarchies of any civilization. The first documented account of an epidemic in the year 430 BCE also documents that societal breakdown. It comes from the Athenian exile turned pundit Thucydides who wrote his history of the wars between Athens and Sparta after he was banished from his polis. Many of you have probably read the soaring funeral speech given by the Athenian general Pericles during the winter before this epidemic broke out in which he praised the institutions of democracy in his polis and eulogized the young men who had died in the initial campaigns of 431 in the name of its values. Sadly, you probably encountered this speech recorded for us by Thucydides himself, who was there, in an excerpted version and not in its historical context. For no sooner had Pericles' oratory died away, the policies and stratagems that had led to the war caused the outbreak of a plague that killed an estimated 75 to 100,000 people in this small city over a three year period. That is at least half of the entire population of Athens. This population had just recently increased because at Pericles' behest, families and agricultural laborers living in Attica in the region around Athens had been encouraged to move inside the walls of Athens, abandon their farms and crops to the Spartans to avoid stretching the resources of Athens' citizen militia. As a result, tens of thousands of newly impoverished country folk moved within the walls of Athens with their livestock, camping out in its narrow streets and marketplaces. Thanks to Athens' formidable navy, Pericles had reasoned, this entire population could survive on supplies shipped in from the port of Piraeus, which was connected to the city by its long walls, nearly seven miles long. So it was that at least some of the more than 30 pathogens that have since been identified as causing the plague in Athens came in with those overseas supplies, while others had just come in from the countryside. The result was probably typhoid, combined with a viral hemorrhagic fever from person to person contact, as with Ebola, and certainly exacerbated by other diseases as well as by mal malnutrition and overcrowding. While these medical diagnoses have been made with the help of ancient DNA in the past 15 years or so, Thucydides himself describes the causative conditions which he observed and suffered. And this is Thucydides. Distress was aggravated by the migration from country to city. There were no houses for the new arrivals, so they had to live in stifling huts in the hot season of the year and destructive destruction raged unchecked. The bodies of the dead and dying were piled upon one another. Sanctuaries in which people were camping were filled with corpses. All the funeral customs which had previously been observed were thrown into confusion and the dead were buried in any way possible. In other respects too, the plague marked the beginning of a decline to greater lawlessness. People were more willing to do things which they would not previously had, have admitted to. No one was willing to persevere in struggling for an honorable result. Meanwhile, people dying inside the city were dying inside the city and the land was already being laid waste outside. Already over farm, the Attic Peninsula was now a wasteland of smoking olive groves and wine vines, the two major staples and marketable commodities in the region, both of which would take at least a generation to regrow if they were ever replanted. Oh, and Pericles' strategy of relying on imports from Athens overseas colonies and allies, this turned out to be a massive uh, miscalculation as those colonies were themselves laid waste by the Spartans uh, as they acquired their own navy and blockaded the port of Piraeus. So eventually the Athenians were starved into submission and surrendered their empire and its walls and their democracy in 404 BCE.
So that's our first narrative of an epidemic, which even on a localized scale caused between 50 and 100,000 deaths in a small city. What about this medieval mother of all pandemics, which unfolded on a global or at least hemispheric scale? Our knowledge of this plague has been utterly transformed in the last five years. Um, much of this research, uh, I'm proud to say, was published, um, as, as was kindly mentioned, in the journal that I helped to found at the, at the University of Middle uh, Illinois. Um, and this per particular issue, edited by Dr. Monica Green, uh, assembled scholars across the spectrum of the humanities, sciences, and social sciences to present the results of their research in an open access uh, publication, which you can find online, and it's also been published as a, as a book. That research was catalyzed, uh, again, remarkably in 2011 by the discovery of one of London's massive cemeteries for Black death victims, excavated by a team of historians and bioarchaeologists who were able to extract ancient DNA from the teeth of those victims. This led in turn to the sequencing of uh, the Yersinia pestis genome in 2013. That is, I'm showing you a family tree that reveals the morphology, the mutations of this bacterium over a 5,000 year period. Um, so for example, here we're seeing uh, the explosion of pathogens which caused the Justinianic plague in the later Roman Empire in the sixth century. Um, and then here we're seeing the what the, is colloquially called the, the Big Bang, the polytomy, which catalyzed the Black Death um, in the Middle Ages. Um, and since then, um, as I noted above, further research has shown that the Black Death was at least um, 3,000 years older, that it had reshaped the Bronze Age world through intensified movement, especially over land. Um, so this map, which shows us three waves of the Yersinia pestis pandemic, is already incomplete because it's showing us uh, allegedly the first pandemic, that is the sixth century Justinianic plague, which we now know is not the first. It was many, many, many plagues in the, in the future. Um, this allegedly the second wave, which is the medieval Black Death, and this is the current um, kind of polytomy of the Black Death, which still exists. The Yersinia pestis is notoriously embedded in um, mountainous, dry, cooler climates, including our, in our own American Southwest. So again, um, this map is is no longer is no longer accurate. Um, so again, if we cast our minds back to the late Bronze Age, what we have to recognize is that, again, a period of intensified movement through trade, um, overland uh, communication on horseback, horses being hosts to uh, Yersinia pestis, as well as to other diseases. Um, it's also being spread by sea. Um, uh, you know, and at the same time, researchers are getting a better and better idea of the homeland of Yersinia pestis. Um, and if you think back to that map I showed you, it's showing a radiating kind of um, trajectories of this plague Bacillus, which is now, the best guess we have, seems to be originating somewhere here in uh, the Northeastern, is in Northeastern Central Asia. So not in China, as was even a year ago previously thought, but somewhere in what is now Kyrgyzstan. Uh, that said, um, the historian Robert Himes, an eminent historian of medieval China, has had already hypothesized that whatever the geographical origins of the Black Death, its super spreader event happened at least a hundred years earlier in China than historians had thought. In research that's still ongoing, Professor Himes is gathering evidence from Chinese medical treatises, which indicate that the Black Death pandemic uh, was already raging in Imperial China by the, by the 1230s and might even have been active in the late 12th century. Its, its westward spread, uh, its spread eastward and westward was then, as we know, accelerated by the Mongol conquests of the ensuing 13th century, which eventually brought it to the Mediterranean and then from there to Northern Europe, as well as to Africa, and then through other routes to the Horn of Africa and we are now thinking into Sub-Saharan Africa as well. 
Um, that said, it's really important to mention that a lot of the myths attaching to the Black Death also have to be revised. So for example, there's a famous story that the Black Death was spread from the Crimea via the Mongol siege of the Genoese trading port at Kaffa there in 1347. Um, and this turns out to be wrong. A young historian, Hannah Barker, has shown uh, in a forthcoming essay, actually it might just be out, um, that uh, this was not chemical warfare on the part of the, 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 the Mongols, that this was part of a, just a regular shipment of grain that was traveling from the Black Sea region to, to Europe. So just as phrases like the Spanish flu or the China virus attempt to demonize Oriental others by pinning the blame on them, so this story of the Mongols um, is, uh, is a myth. Um, that what we have to realize is that the medieval globe is a densely interconnected network of spaces uh, in which disease uh, is going to travel, is going to travel very rapidly. Um, so this means that I'm showing you here a very old map, which is sort of the conventional mapping of the Black Death. Um, so it's not just that this conventional mapping and dating is wrong, because we now know that this pandemic was at least 150 years older than it seemed, seemed to have been. Um, but this whole narrative that the Black Death is always coming from somewhere else, it's always coming from the East, is also not accurate. Um, because the Black Death, once it arrives in Europe, becomes endemic in Europe. It stays in Europe. Uh, it becomes a European disease, as is now it, it is a, as much an American disease as an African or, a, or an Asian one. Um, moreover, the traditional culprit responsible for the Black Death, uh, the humble rat, um, um, actually turns out to have been unfairly demonized as the major vector for this disease. In fact, as we now know, uh, the Yersinia pestis virus uh, can travel and be fostered by a whole range of animal hosts, including really, really, really adorable ones. Um, but one of the major perpetrators in medieval Europe was the marmot. Um, uh, in fact, the, 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 Mo the Mongols appreciation of this giant rodent, which is about half the size of a, a human being as a source of fur and food is well known. So the marmot's prevalence and popularity in uh, Eurasia um, uh, and its sociable character, it, it, it likes humans, it likes to cozy up to them, um, put them in, in close proximity to humans who use their, their fur uh, for, for garments um, and actually also befriended them, kept them as pets. Um, uh, there were Alpine villagers who used to take marmots down into the big cities in uh, south of France and into Italy as performing kind of, you know, performing animals, and again, thereby spread the disease in, into, urban, into urban areas. So again, the, 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 as the Black Death becomes embedded in the flora and fauna of medieval, and indeed the soil of medieval Europe, it becomes a European disease, which helps to explain that here's a map showing, you know, that um, much of the terrain of this part of the world in which Yersinia pestis appears to have been fostered originally, that climate is shared by the Pyrenees, the Alps, um, the Sierra Nevadas. Um, you know, those are the places where Yersinia pestis thrives. Um, this also helps to explain why in remote tiny Alpine villages in the medieval and modern periods, um, people were still building chapels to saints who are credited with the power to relieve Yersinia pestis. So this is a chapel built in the remote French Alps in the 15th century, so long, allegedly long after the Black Death had ceased to be a problem in Europe, but where it's still a problem in these small Alpine villages. And so you're seeing here um, a chapel devoted to Saint Sebastian, who as uh, was credited with the capacity to to heal uh, uh, the plague. And you're seeing here a, a physician, you know, lancing a bubo uh, in a woman's neck that is a, a, pus, a pustule, which is a tactile lymphatic system. Um, you know, you're seeing here a husband, her husband and son showing that they might too, under their armpits, have been developing these, these pustules. And, you know, and we're seeing a small child here looking 
very gray, so suggesting that it has already, already succumbed to this disease. Unlike, so uh, unlike like the coronavirus, which we're, you know, again, we're beginning to understand more and more about the coronavirus in real time. Um, as you guys, we all may remember a year ago, we were told, oh, it's not gonna affect young people. It's not gonna affect kids. You know, if you get it, you'll recover quickly. Um, and we're now learning that um, the way that this disease attacks the body, the way that it morphs, the kinds of damage it can do to organs, we're, we're still so far from knowing everything that we need to know about this disease. Um, and I want to suggest that that should make us extremely empathetic to the medieval people who struggled to understand how plague was spreading in their own communities. Um, uh, they had trouble, you know, they could not pinpoint the place of its or origin. They did understand that overcrowding, that comorbidities like famine, mal malnutrition, hygiene, were factors in spreading the disease. Um, hence the effectiveness on the, of the medieval method that we've been relying on for the last year, quarantine, um, which initially refers to the Venetian policy of keeping newly arrived ships uh, offshore for 40 days before they were allowed to actually dock in the Venetian harbor. In the case of the Black Death, as we now know, um, the cooling of the global climate at the end of the 13th century was not only creating favorable conditions for the resurgence of Yersinia pestis, but it was wreaking havoc on uh, the growing seasons and agricultural productivity of Eurasia uh, and indeed of North America too, as we now know. Um, this was causing farmers all over the Northern hemisphere to put more and more land under cultivation and thus destroying more and more animal habitats and increasing the chances of zoonotic transfer of diseases. You know, in our case, industrial farming and anthropogenic global heating has, has had a devastating effect. Um, another parallel between our pandemic and this medieval one is the confusion caused by various symptoms and bodily responses. Um, you know, in the past, um, readers of medieval accounts of the plague would scoff at testimony like this one, that they would, they would decry the ignorance of these medieval people who expressed confusion over how the plague was transmitted, because as uh, Agnolo di Tura of Siena here tells us, it seemed to, to spread through the breath and sight. But in fact, the medieval plague was terrifying precisely because uh, it morphed into so many forms that it could present and be contracted in a variety of different ways, not just bubonic. In other words, it didn't just attack the lymphatic system and cause these painful swelling buboes, um, but it was also septicemic. It could be contracted through an open wound, even a scratch, mnemonic, very deadly, caused in by breathing droplets. Uh, gastrointestinal, pharyngeal, caused by, you know, developing in the throat or in the gastric system, caused by eating one of the many host animals that, you know, were also domestic livestock, cattle, sheep. Um, so before we mock the masks of medieval plague doctors, as is still very prevalent now in popular culture, it's important that we look in the mirror and see some of our own experiences reflected in this, in this terrifying time. In addition to paying attention to history uh, or to pandemics in history, um, it's really important as a, as a historian uh, to um, appreciate the role of historians in understanding disease. Um, we need to be at the table too, along with epidemiologists and um, public health experts and sociologists because historians have always played a crucial role in identifying and contextualizing the sources which yield evidence for understanding of disease um, and our responses to it. It was the historian and physician, Professor Howard Markle at the University of Michigan who assembled and analyzed the data from the 1918-19 pandemic, enabling him and his team to conceptualize the whole process of flattening the curve, which has been or should have been even more crucial to the models for handling COVID-19. Um, the fact that this flattening of the curve has not worked is not the fault of this historian, it's the fault of the uneven 
um, response to the pandemic, not just in the United States, but elsewhere. Um, a much more humble contribution um, in this case, you know, my own and, and that of my colleagues um, would be to call attention to some of the recurrent historical patterns. And, and I want you know, I was so glad to be given the chance to, to give this talk and to think, reflect as a historian on what are the interesting ways in which um, this material that I've assembled from uh, the distant past, the Bronze Age, um, from the very beginnings of ancient civilizations through to classical Athens, to the Roman Empire, to the Middle Ages, and to now. Um, what are some of the patterns that we can see emerging? Um, and, um, and so this is kind of my, my attempt to, to put that into context. So some of the characteristics that I see when I look at the historical record are um, anthropogenic overreach. Um, uh, you know, whether it's the ancient cities of Mesopotamia or whether it's uh, the wet market in Wuhan or whether it's the destruction of animal habitats in any part of the globe, um, this is increasing the, the, the decimation of natural habitats. It's increasing the possibility that humans are going to come into contact with animals and pathogens that, are, that our bodies are, are unable to handle. And that is going to stimulate the, the conditions for this type of this type of outbreak. Um, and again, I, I, I say this not to be fatalistic. You know, when I mentioned James C. Scott saying that every human civilization is a multi-species settlement camp, and that uh, uh, epidemics, if not pandemics, are a feature, not a bug of civilization. It's precisely if we remember this historical fact that we can prepare for it. We don't have to just throw up our hands and say, there's nothing we can do. We can, you know, in the same way that we keep a fire extinguisher in the house and may never use it, hopefully, thank God, we will never use it, but it's there, um, or a smoke alarm. Um, the reason why one has to have a pandemic plan and be ready to execute it and execute it universally is precisely because we know, history, history tells us that it's going to happen. Um, the other thing that we can see, and Thucydides gives us that harrowing account, is that um, what happens in, in a time of massive disease is that already weakened and unequal socioeconomic conditions um, and infrastructures can contribute to the spread of the plague and can cause disproportionate suffering to marginalized peoples. Um, in our own day, we know that the uh, that um, the coronavirus pandemic is disproportionately affecting um, people of color. It's disproportionately affecting um, marginalized people, the poor. Um, at the same time, it's also disproportionately scapegoating people of Asian descent. In my own period, the scapegoats were very, very frequently the already vulnerable Jewish communities of Europe. Um, who were accused of poisoning wells and causing the conditions in which the Black Death would spread. So um, any tensions that are already coming to the surface or buried beneath the surface um, in a society can come to the top at, at a time like this. In fact, many of the, many of the Jewish populations who were um, murdered by their Christian neighbors in medieval Europe during the Black Death had been living side by side with those neighbors for decades, for generations. Um, but it was this catalyst that um, caused a, a wave of pogroms um, throughout uh, uh, Christian Europe in, in the 14th century. We also see um, in all these uh, cases, the breakdown of fragile institutions of governance, community norms and neighborliness. Number Thucydides said people, would, people were starting to do things that they would never have done. People were starting to feel so desperate or so um, privileged or so, um, you know, um, feeling that it was no, no, no longer necessary to abide by the civilities of, of neighborliness, of civil society, um, that they were willing to, 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 to take risks um, uh, and, put, and put their neighbors at risk. So this is going to mean that these fragile institutions are going to, again, create 
scapegoating, um, you know, in our own case, structural racism, this is going to manifest itself in different ways, depending on the conditions of the, you know, particular, you know, society in, in history. Um, I would also point, I think, to, um, uh, you know, the uneven or uninformed public, public health responses, uh, which are, you um, you know, again, a problem of ancient and medieval societies and have turned out since the, the year that we've been dealing with this to be very much a problem in our own society too. Um, you can have the best plan in the world, but if you don't have anybody to enforce it and you don't have a sense of shared obligation and citizenship amongst the people of a given society, then that plan is gonna be, is gonna be ineffectual. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that we are, you know, probably going to have to be anticipating in future years and decades to come, which is longer term social, economic and political effects, um, which could manifest themselves. They certainly did during the Black, after the Black Death in popular rebellions, civil unrest, um, um, even more autocratic uh, shutdowns um, uh, in, and crackdowns on these kinds of things in ensuing decades. Um, some of these after effects are, um, one could say, more positive. Um, you know, in the Middle Ages, um, the the and in fact, I actually have a couple of slides which I can even show about this. Let me just sort of I see if I can fast forward here. Yeah, um, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, so for example, I mentioned that um, the intensified uh, hatred of medieval Christians toward their Jewish neighbors manifests itself in pogroms against those Jewish communities. And I'm showing you here um, a recently excavated cemetery in Catalonia, which we have, we have both textual documentary evidence of the pogrom against these Jews. And we also have this particular mass um, this, this communal grave. I won't say it's a mass grave because it was actually a grave that was dug for the surviving Jews of this community um, for their loved ones. Um, uh, and again, it happened um, in the summer of 1348 um, in the aftermath of a, an outbreak of the Black Death. So that is very much a, a massive and, and, and tragic um, consequence of this type of pandemic. Um, we can point to, um, uh, you know, medieval Jews had already been scapegoated and targeted, um, being forced by uh, both ecclesiastical and secular authorities to wear a distinctive badge, the Jewish badge. This is a medieval invention, which is revived, as we all know, um, in the 1930s in German occupied territories of Europe. Um, and was used uh, in the project of rounding up the Jews of Europe for extermination. Um, so this is a, a, an unfortunate legacy of the Middle Ages. Um, and of course, the idea that um, Jews are apt to try to target Christians, to kidnap Christian children, and torture and kill them, is very much a, um, a revival right now in the QAnon conspiracy universe of the medieval idea of blood libel. So we're seeing weird um, echoes of these medieval superstitions coming back in our own time. But maybe a more hopeful thing we could point to is that if we look back in the 1350s in the immediate aftermath of the Black Death, Europe's population has been reduced by 50%. Um, and this means that land, which had been overcultivated for hundreds of years, is finally able to lie fallow again. Hundreds of thousands of villages are abandoned um, throughout Afro-Eurasia in, in the aftermath of the Black Death. And that means land that had been over-intensively cultivated, you know, look at this rocky land that people were trying to put under cultivation in the 15th century, mm -hmm. is allowed to come back and, and become fertile again. So um, that is a, a, a positive, you know, for the people who, for the medieval people who survive the Black Death, um, it means more, uh, it means not only more land, but it also means few, less land has to be under cultivation to feed the massive population. That means that people are eating a more varied diet, that you're not having to put everything under a wheat. You're able to grow legumes and vegetables and you're able to pasture livestock. And um, people were eating a healthier diet uh, around 1400 in the aftermath of the Black Death in Europe than they eat now in Europe. Um, 
precisely because there were more resources for the people who, who survived. Um, another positive outcome, I guess, from a, a sort of so socioeconomic standpoint, um, and I'll sort of close with this sort of helpful, hopeful idea, um, is that laborers, uh, for the first time, recognized that their labor was valuable. Um, I would love to see the same thing happen in our own society. Um, why just the fight for 15? Why not? You know, these are the medieval peasants. Th those were the frontline, um, you know, um, essential workers of the medieval world. And it was in the aftermath of the Black Death then when they recognized that they are the ones who have the know-how to cultivate the fields, to provide the, the food that is, is, is feeding the entire population. Um, and they take political action. There are essentially labor strikes throughout medieval Europe in the wake of the Black Death. Um, England, the parliament in England desperately tries to pass a law preventing medieval peasants from moving around. Uh, you notice the way parliament puts it, it's because of the malice of these idle servants and peasants. No, it's not their malice. They recognize that their labor is valuable and they're moving around in search of people who are willing to pay them a living wage. And parliament desperately tries to keep them you know, uh, down on the farm and not looking for geographical mobility and social mobility and opportunity. Um, and, um, you know, this, this law and subsequent laws passed out after it fail, fail miserably. Um, uh, indeed we can map, um, the spread of the black death in medieval Europe and we, a lot, and we can, and it's, and it's recession, it's recedence, um, with a whole wave of workers' rebellions, um, throughout these territories because people recognize that their voices are now valuable, um, their labor is valuable and they can be heard. Um, so this peasants revolt in England is only one of this, of this string of rebellions. Um, so, you know, as I like to teach my students, you know, geographical mobility, social mobility, economic mobility, all these things are bound up together. And, and at least for a few generations after the medieval black death, that was a time of tremendous opportunity, um, for the people of the middle ages. Um, so. I'll end there on that hopeful note. We would love, to, I would, you know, I'm very happy to entertain questions about, about any of this. Um, I would welcome also your speculations about, given the patterns that I've tried to trace here, um, how do we think that those things are gonna unfold for us? And, you know, I'm a historian, I'm not a fortune teller, um, um, but it is interesting to speculate given the laboratory of history and what it teaches us how that might um, also be, you know, potentially playing out in our in our own day, um, as we process the um, what we've learned and what we haven't learned, what we failed to learn um, collectively as a society from our own particular pandemic trauma. Yeah. So thanks so much. So I have two questions from the chat. Uh, the first one is, ha uh, David asks, have you ever visited the Bone Church, the Sedlik Ossuary outside of Prague in the Czech Republic? I never have. And I'm so envious of people. I mean, I've never, I mean, I've, I've never been to Prague. I've never, I've been to, I've been to Poland. I've been to Hungary, but I've never been to the Czech Republic. Um, I've seen some amazing documentary footage of that incredible church. Um, but no, I've, I've never been. But what a what a monument to mortality <laughs> that is. <laughs> and then uh, Priscilla asks, do you think the pandemic contributed to the January 6th events at the Capitol? Oh, Priscilla, that's such a great question. I mean, it's, I would say, sure. Um, you know, there would, could, the, could those events have unfolded without the pandemic? Quite possibly. Um, you know, given what we know about um, um, President Trump's, um, you know, insistence on, you know, his, his right to be reelected, regardless of the facts. Um, but would so many people have been willing to, you know, leave home, you know, make, take that stand, make that show, uh, if they had not been, you know, surrounded by so many other types of trauma um, and denial of trauma, um, 
you know, it's, you know, so would it have happened on such a scale? Um, that's a really, I mean, that is, I think, something that we're going to have to be weighing that, you know, there's been a lot of talk as we've been watching the second impeachment trial um, about, you know, how history is going to judge this, you know, and obviously I'm a historian of the ancient and medieval world. I'm not a, I'm not a U.S. historian. Um, and I value the testimony of my colleagues so much at this time. Um, um, but I, I think as a historian who's trying to look at bigger patterns, it's hard not to see how things that would already have been, mo you know, um, phenomena of enormous kind of political and socioeconomic um, frustration for people um, becoming even more uh, explosive, you know, and I think that we saw that this summer um, in the Black Lives Matter protests at the, in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder and the recognition of the kind of scale of brutality um, against um, African-American men in particular and women in our country. Um, uh, so yeah, I think, I think everything has been kind of ratcheted up in a big way. Um, and, and I, you know, and that's why I wanted to be careful and say, it's not that there weren't, there wasn't violence against Jews in medieval Europe before the plague, there certainly was. Um, it tended to happen, though, at times of increased um, social and, and political crisis. So, for example, we know that uh, violence against Jews tended to happen every time there was a call for a crusade. Um, uh, so, you know, certain kinds of political rhetoric, certain kinds of movements tend to have these kinds of ripple effects, and they tend to affect disproportionately those people in any given society and historical era who are already vulnerable and who are already um, kind of struggling on the margins of society. A few more from the chat. Uh, Rick asks, what about helping other countries in Africa, South America? Do we share vaccinations? Yeah, I think that's such a, Rick, that's such a great point. I mean, I, I you know, what the, what our growing knowledge of the medieval Black death is teaching us is that, uh, you know, those, that the entire Afro-Eurasian landmass was completely interconnected. One, one, one slide I didn't show, um, um, but I'll just mention is, um, we know, for example, that the scale of uh, depopulation in North Africa was so great that irrigation canals linking the Nile to the fertile farmlands of Egypt irrigation canals that had been maintained since the time of the pharaohs for 5,000 years, there's no longer enough people to maintain those. And Egypt is the breadbasket of the Mediterranean. So if Egyptian agriculture fails, everybody in the Mediterranean basin does not eat. So, so the idea that, you know, it's some, you know, it, it is not just, it is enlightened self-interest for us in developed countries to be uh, protecting and providing for our neighbors in the global south, in Africa, in Asia, um, because again, even if even if even if we're doing this just for selfish reasons, which I would hope we weren't, but it's because we live in an interconnected world. And even though the medieval globe is a, a, maybe a G with a small G, you know, um, you know, we're not. We don't know if there's. Uh, we don't know yet the extent of, um, for example, oceanic um, connect connectivity in the 13th or 14th centuries. But the point is that people came to recognize in their own small way the degree to which all of these things are interconnected. And we, of course, cannot guard against that um, in, our, in our age of, of global travel and um, all those kinds of things. So absolutely, I think we need to be you know, here's where the nation, you know, the nation state, which is a sort of a modern invention, has its beginnings in the Middle Ages. Um, it, it is a, it is, is a, is a, is a barrier. Um, the more we think about us versus them, and the more we think about enough stuff for us and just to take care of ourselves, the more we're ignoring the fact that these things that we call borders are porous. They always have been porous. They're, they're, and, and, you know, and it is, it is, again, it's, it's enlightened self-interest, uh, if not good Christian or good human values to be sharing 
resources. Hopefully I don't mispronounce this if I do, my apologies, but Barry asks, there's been such an unequal impact by COVID across countries, 25 dead in New Zealand, 460,000 in the US. Is that indeed unique historically? That's such a great question, Barry. Um, one of the things I pointed to was the unevenness of government responses to the plague. Um, and I think one would find, if one went back to the 14th century in Europe, you would find similar disparities. Um, there were some communities that were extraordinarily um, successful in keeping, um, keeping their population safe um, by imposing a very strict quarantine, um, by not allowing people to leave their homes which of course, as you can imagine, no one likes that. You know, people didn't like it in the 14th century, they don't like it now. But there were some, uh, especially um, more autocratic. Um, so for example, um, uh, you know, um, in Venice, which had a very sort of autocratic kind of hierarchical structure, um, you know, seemed to have done, did, done pretty well compared to how bad it could have been. Um, so some, you know, depending on your, and we've seen this with Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, depending on how determined your ruler is to, um, to put these strictures in place and to maintain them, it can have an enormously positive effect. Not all rulers were able to do that. Um, not all of them had the power to do that. Um, sometimes conditions just didn't make that possible. So I actually think that we would see a similar sort of disparity and unevenness in the response. Um, something we do see absolutely in the historical record is that there were some um, urban areas that were actually trying to keep track of the death toll. Uh, so in places like um, Northern Italy, in the Islamic world, where there were very old traditions of record keeping, um, keeping censuses, we know that, for example, the Sultan in North Africa in, you know, um, Muslim Egypt was, had, you, when people died, they had to register, the relatives had to register that death with the local authority. So we actually know how many people were dying in, um, in Northern, in, in North Africa, um, you know, under, under these Islamic rulers. We don't know that stuff from from London, because people were just thrown into pits. There was no attempt to document them. So again, you know, these uneven responses when it comes to keeping people safe, um, documenting what's actually going on, um, keeping a record. Um, uh, you know, some some towns were very successful in protecting their Jewish populations from um, from violence. Um, you know, uh, and others were not. So again, really, really uneven depending upon um, what the local authorities were empowered to do and how their communities responded. This one comes from Michael. Uh, he says, Paul Farmer in a recent book has emphasized that the Ebola outbreak was much worse because of a lack of basic medical infrastructure. And that's true for cholera and Haiti also. Would you agree that that is true for all pandemics, including COVID? I mean, absolutely. Um, medical infrastructure is hugely important. Um, you know, this is a place where, you know, I, I was urging, you know, empathy for our medieval counterparts as they struggle to deal with a disease that we only know more about. I mean, we know, we know more in the last five years than people have known about this disease for a thousand years. Um, so, um, you know, so, you know, so clearly the medieval response was hampered by uh, a lack of understanding uh, of how, how this disease spread, um, the many different forms it could take. Um, and also by the fact that, you know, most, especially in, in Christian Europe, um, uh, and I say that because um, Muslim science and um, the network of Muslim hospitals and the types of medical knowledge that was available in the Islamic world was far superior in this time than it was in, in, in Christian medieval Europe. Um, they're just, I mean, there were hospitals in medieval Europe, but they were not intended for this type of, um, th this type of mortality. Um, they were, they were, you know, small, mostly monastery run um, institutions. So, um, you know, there would have been no way. Um, and I think that, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think we've seen that 
in you know even in a country like like ours where we pride ourselves on having the most up to date medical technologies um you know we all saw the you know horrific images of overwhelmed hospitals in new york and and other urban areas and um i think one of the puzzles then becomes you know as i mentioned given that we know historically and epidemiologically that epidemics and pandemics are going to happen um, how do we find a balance between maintaining a sufficient infrastructure, which is going to enable us to move quickly when we need to, when there's an out outbreak, um, um, but also, of course, not how do we do that without, you know, pouring so many resources into that sort of infrastructure that it's taking away from other kinds of things. But um, you know, absolutely. I think that unevenness, you know, the, you know, I, I mentioned that Yersinia pestis, this medieval um, bacillus of the plague um, is, you know, it, it still survives in, in parts of, um, in parts of Africa and parts of Asia and parts of North America, where the climactic conditions are favorable. But it's not an accident that when this, when the plague breaks out, it tends to become more deadly in Africa, not because, you know, precisely because of it tends to be a, a, a lack of the type of medical you know if you if you if you happen to be so unlucky as to encounter a rodent you know while hiking in you know the American Southwest uh, you will figure you will you will you will be able to get medical attention but that's not always the case in some more remote areas this question is from Sue. Uh, she asks, do you think the world population has reached a point that there will most likely be pandemic after pandemic? Sue, it's a great question. And I mentioned that, um, you, know, we, you know, we don't know what the population numbers for the Middle Ages were, but we do know that um, the population of the Eurasian landmass was so great um, around the year 1300 um, that essentially every inch of land that could be pulled, put under cultivation was under cultivation, like from Ireland to the Ukraine. I mean, you know, Europe could not feed its people, no matter how much um, land it had under the plow. You know, you add that to the cooling climate, in our case, the warming climate. So in the Middle Ages, the cooling climate was, was causing famine. In our own age, it's going to be causing, you know, unknown uh, kinds of disasters. Um, uh, and, um, you know, and yeah, and so all of these kind of underlying conditions, which exacerbate um, and, and, you know, exacerbate the plague and make it more deadly. Um, uh, I think that we see that happening in the 13th and 14th centuries. Um, and, the, and yet the population is a fraction of what it is on the globe today. Um, so I think that in addition to, again, I, and I, I don't mean this to be fatalistic, because I think that if we can if we can anticipate the need for this type of infrastructure and cooperation and understanding, we might be able to head some of these things off. Um, but you know, given that we know that that um, we're destroying natural habitats, given what we know about the, the warming of the climate, given what we know about the size of the population, given that we know that um, competition for water and other essential resources is going to be ever more um, you know, ever more intense uh, in the coming decades. I think we have to brace ourselves for um, the reality that these types of um, diseases are are going to be more prevalent unless we can unless we can make some kind of a major major change. And you know, this is the other thing about being a historian. Like, you know, if you look, <laughs> you know, I've got ten thousand years of data which tells me that people tend to respond in the same kinds of ways to um, the same kinds of pressures and it just happens at different scales um, and I, you know and, and you know we all wish we could learn more from the laboratory of the past um, and um, that's what I, I would hope but um, it would take a tremendous act of global cooperation and then this question is from John. He asks, how could the Black Death have existed for so long before the massive outbreak in Europe without being identified at the time? Is it simply the poor state of communications? Great, great question. Um, so I mentioned this, uh, this brilliant uh, historian, Robert Bob Himes at Columbia. Um, 
who is doing amazing research into Chinese language sources, because one of the one of the problems has been, um, you know, if the black if if um, science is teaching us that uh, the Black Death actually was breaking out in Central Asia and in Imperial China 150, 200 years before it reaches Europe, why isn't it being mentioned in Chinese sources? Um, and what Bob is preparing to argue based on his analysis of these sources is that it is being talked about, but it's being talked about in a very euphemistic way. Um, and he's finding references, for example, in, tr in Chinese medical treatises to um, symptoms that match up with some of the symptoms that we see um, that are coming from, you know, the plague. And he's seeing references in particular to the use of rhubarb as, um, as a curative. And it turns out that there are, there are chemicals in rhubarb which are actually useful for treating the plague. So, so part of it is we're not sure yet how to read some of these sources, you know, it, until somebody comes along and is able to look at this entire corpus of sources um, the way that Bob Himes is doing. We don't know that. Um, absolutely. I mean, you know, people are, you know, as the Mongols are moving in and out of this region where Yersinia pestis is already embedded, um, that's happening really quickly. You know, that's causing, you know, a, a massive spreading of, not just Yersinia pestis, but a lots of different kinds of things. And, you know, it's, you know, when it's happening in real time and you don't have global news and satellites and social media, uh, you know, there, there's, there's no way for this kind of news to, to, to spread. Um, uh, so, so I think that it's, it's partly that the kind of communication infrastructure is just not as robust and it's slower than it is now. But part of it is also that we historians have only just begun to work with our colleagues in the sciences. Um, and you know, the, the way that what's exciting about being a historian now is that you have to be able to um, talk to and, and, and um, work with you know, people in a huge array of disciplines because, because it, when, when history is dependent upon the study of disease and ancient DNA and mapping of genomes, um, that means that, you know, if, 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 you know, the documentary record is like this big, it means that it's expanding what we can do as historians. And it's really exciting. You know, the, the everything, you know, by the time our kids or grandkids are, are, uh, you know, in school, what they're going to know about the distant past is just like astronomical compared to what we know. So part of it is just that we as historians haven't known how to haven't had this evidence or we haven't known how to read this evidence. Um, and that's, that makes it really exciting actually. All right. So those are all the questions from the chat box. Everybody should now be able to turn their video on and unmute. If you have a question for our speaker. Thanks for the great questions, everybody. I wish I could answer. I wish I could answer those I wish I could better and more authoritatively speak to those that are of absolute moment for us right now as people living on this planet. Um, Carol, as a historian, um, can you get into a little bit more of what happened in Europe when Europe lost almost half of its population rather suddenly? You, you've, you've, you've spoken about the, the farmland and about the value of labor and so forth, but but obviously, this would have had major structural impact. Absolutely. No, it, it impacted every, um, you know, historians are now thinking about trauma with respect to the Black Death, um, you know, multi-generational trauma. Um, mm. You know, how is this, how can we see um, both the, the sort of physiological and psychological emotional effects of this actually showing up in the artwork? The literature that's being produced um, in medieval Europe. How do we see it um, affecting, um, uh, you know, how do we see it affecting um, attitudes toward religion? Um, you know, it, it, it can't really be an accident that uh, essentially proto-Protestant movements, um, Wycliffe, uh, John Wycliffe in England, um, who was a major religious reformer, who insisted on translating the Bible into English, who was a, uh, wanted to break up all of church property and give it to the poor, 
Um, you know, so we're seeing like these, these huge ideological shifts in what, um, you know, activists and reformers are willing to, to think about and talk about. Um, we're seeing shifts in, um, as I mentioned, in, in the way that people uh, think about their world, uh, the way that they envision God, the way that they, um, the way that they uh, sort of hypothesize um, ideas about the afterlife. Um, you know, so I, I, I don't want to be too reductive and say that everything that's going to be unfolding in the, you know, 15th and 16th centuries, you know, which is, you know, uh, 15th century, an age of tremendous kind of global warfare and, um, you know, and then it's going to culminate in the Protestant Reformation. And then, you know, um, I'm not saying that all of these things, you know, might not have happened without the Black Death, but it just seems like there's a, there's, there's a, there's a real catalytic kind of movement there. Um, you know, so uh, you know, even even attitudes toward women and their rights is really interesting. Um, there's a there's a huge debate that emerges in the in the de decades after Black Death called the the querelle des femmes, the the argument about women, um, where you have essentially or you know kind of proto feminists like uh, the first female professional author Christine de Pizan. Um, in France, um, essentially pushing back against, you know, hundreds of years worth of misogynistic narratives about women and demanding, you know, that women should have a place in political life and social life. And, um, you know, so I think absolutely, if you scratch the surface of anything that's going on, you know, in those generations immediately after the Black Death, you're going to be seeing not just its you know, nutritional and socioeconomic and political effects, but you're going to see cultural effects, aesthetics effects, religious effects, um, all of these different kinds of things. Now, as part of what you just mentioned, especially the, the feminist part, uh, due to a changing sex ratio where men are much more susceptible to death um, from the Black Death, and, and so suddenly we've got women who are seeking a place in society that don't find it in regular marriage roles and so forth? You know, that's a great question. I mean, I think that, um, in fact, Monica Green, I, whom I mentioned, who, who uh, edited this wonderful issue for us and has continued to work on the Black Death. She just published a piece I haven't had a chance to read about, about women and the Black Death. It's not clear yet, as far as I know, what we have learned about um, you know, gender, sex, age related characteristics of the Black Death. It's, it's not clear whether it is having a more deleterious effect on, um, you know, women versus men, or um, it's just, that's just not clear yet. I think that what I would say is that what the Black Death reveals to everybody who survives it is that any claims to social, you know, any claims to the fact that, you know, the nobility are naturally superior to the peasantry, it's impossible to, to sustain that. You know, the great rallying cry of John Wycliffe and the religious reformers in England was when Adam delved in Eve Span, who then was a gentleman, you know, like what, back in the day when we were thrust out of Eden and we all had to work for a living, we're all peasants. You know, we're all peasants under the skin. And I think that that same argument that's being made for social equality is being made by women like Christine for gender equality um, because the, you know, disease is no respecter of those kinds of things. Um, and, but I think it's a fascinating thing to posit, you know, is it, is it that, you know, do people emerge from this with a, a better understanding of women's labor, are, you know, is is there a sense in which there are so many female-headed households, perhaps, that is that is transforming um, the way that people think? I do think that geographical, as I mentioned, geographical mobility, social mobility, all those kinds of things are linked, and that may also be creating sort of some new ideas about um, gender inequality. Um, I, or gender equality. Um, I will say that here's an irony is that, you know, most of the Middle Ages is a time of tremendous empowerment for women. Um, women are, it's really only in the 12th to, I, I know this for, if you're not a medievalist, it seems like splitting hairs, but basically um, women are actually incredibly powerful in, in, and have a lot of social and political clout in the Middle Ages. And that starts to kind of get 
constricted in the 12th or 13th century. So in the couple of centuries before the Black Death, um, their, their roles are being narrowed. And so it does seem as though the Black Death is kind of relaxing some of that kind of, um, that kind of narrowing down of avenues for, for women. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's and again, in the, in the aftermath of this ma massive trauma, you know, people have better things to, to do than to kind of, you know, you know, police the, the, the gender boundaries, um, hopefully. Thank you. Thanks. I could add a comment about uh, the Black Death uh, and, and, and as we try to analyze behavior of the people who lived or died during this time, and we try to interpret about how they behave because of infection, but the, there was no concept of infection in those days. We, we laughed at this, the silly suits that they wore to protect themselves. And we knew that if a ship was trying to uh, disembark and, and people were dying on the ship, they knew better than to let the ship unload their passengers, but they, but they didn't really have a concept of, of infection. And even, in, and even much, more, much more recently, you know, they, they, they didn't talk about viruses and so on. They talked about the night air was bad for you, you know, and things like that. They just didn't understand, you know, what, what this infection was all about. No, I mean, that, of course, they didn't. Uh, and yet at the same, I mean, I, uh, I think what I, what I wanted to emphasize was, you know, to say that the virus seemed to spread, spread through breath and sight, or it seems to spread through the night air. Sure, that's not a scientific explanation, but what it captures is an understanding that things are being transmitted in ways that we don't understand. Um, and, um, and, and given, as I mentioned, that Yersinia pestis attacks the body in so many different ways. You know, if, you, if, it, if, if, if it attacks your lymphatic system and you get those awful buboes, you're actually much more likely to survive. Um, and so how, as a person, do you make sense of the fact that, okay, I have had these buboes and I've survived. And then all of a sudden, you know, this person next to me drops dead without a mark on them. Um, because unbeknownst to me, they've eaten something or they've inhaled something and it's, it's attacked their body in a different way. Um, and, you know, so I, again, I find that a, a tremendous sort of call for empathy, um, you know, rather than be like, oh, those medieval people, they're so stupid, you know, like, oh, no, actually, there's just a lot of things that they just had no concept of. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we have run out of the question, so <laughs> let's give a big thanks to Carol for this wonderful presentation and response to questions. Thank you so much, everybody. And hopefully uh, you've, you've got an amazing lineup for the next few weeks. So it looks like you've got some people come on the roster who are going to be doing a better job of answering some of these um, kind of more, you know, current of the moment disease related questions. But, but hopefully this has been useful in thinking about the, the kinship that we have with generations of people who have come before us, um, who have struggled with some of the, the same kinds of issues. Thank you so much. We always hope that the, the first lecturer in a series is one who is um, so sharp and, and knowledgeable that everyone comes back to all the future lectures. And I think in our case, we lucked out with you. Thanks so much, Carol. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been such a great opportunity to, to, to meet some, some new friends. So stay warm there in Nebraska. Bye-bye. <laughs> um, Thank you, Carol. Take care, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.